Welcome to Teaching That Counts, a podcast dedicated to the teaching and learning of mathematics. I'm your host, Abel Maeses, and I love to talk about math education. Together with my amazing guests, we'll explore several topics in the world of math teaching and student learning. Whether it's building thinking classrooms, healing math trauma, building student and teacher math confidence, or creating more equitable math workspaces. If it's going to help students learn math and teachers teach math, then we'll talk about it. So if you're a teacher, a parent like me, admin, or a coach like me, I hope you find something that that can inspire you and help build your practice listening to this podcast. You can always find us online at www.teachingthatcountspodcast.com. Yeah, I know that's long, but hey, that's the URL. Uh, You can find me on YouTube at Maestas Math or on socials at Maestas Teach. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, all right. Welcome back to the podcast. And uh, man, it's been a while. I realize that it's been over a month since the last podcast, and I apologize for that. But hey, those of you that are not new listeners that have been listening to the show, some of you know that I have been running for election. That's right. We, as of the time of this recording, election day is tomorrow, and I have been running for local school board. So I've been on the school board, but this is the first time that I've actually been running against an opponent. Last time I was, I I had a, you know, I was uh, running on a post. This time I've had an opponent, and we've really been running a, a strong race and I have been very, very busy over the last month and a half, running a campaign, getting out, walking and talking to people, um, doing advertising, all of those things to make sure that I can continue to do work in providing the best education for the kids, including my own kids, in our dist- district here in the Central Valley of California. So um, those of you that are, are listeners, I hope you're rooting for me. And uh, if you're not, that's okay too. <laughs> Everyone has <laughs> whatever uh, opinion you have on the race. Um, but that's the reason why I haven't been able to put up a new podcast in in a little, well, about almost two months now. So, but uh, with the election happening tomorrow, I am super excited to get this podcast back up and running and get you guys some great content every each and every month. And we're going to start with this month. We're going to start with the second half of my interview with Peter Lilladal that we had in the last one. So I know that many of you have been eagerly awaiting this part two of my interview. And so I want to let you know what is happening with this interview. And uh, as we talked, myself and Peter talked about in the last piece um, randomization, the things that were going on that we can be doing with our kids. We started getting into the conversation. The second part you're going to hear is about non-curricular tasks and the importance of non-curricular tasks. We know that non-curricular tasks are so very, very important for students. And Peter, Peter and I have a discussion on why they are so important and really how often you should be doing these. And when in the school year are the best times to be doing non-curricular tasks. So I know everyone's excited to hear about when, how to do non-curricular tasks, and really why are they so important. And you're going to get a lot of that new green book there. If you haven't gotten that the new book, you should go get it. Go out and get it and, and read those first parts. Um, then in the second half of our discussion, we revisit the issue of homework. Yeah, homework is a big issue And I know that there are different people on different sides of the coin, but we know about how homework can be um, can really be a negative for students in the primary grades. And how can we use homework effectively for students to get really a check for their own understanding, as is written in in building thinking classrooms. So Peter discusses on uh, really here's here's the issue, right? Here's the issue with homework that I know many of you out there struggle with. And 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 in some cases here in the district that I provide my support with teachers here 
is that we have a lot of parents and admin especially that want kids to have homework, right? They're like, well, we need to have kids having this much homework or even, well, I'm going to say even worse, but even uh, a bigger issue is our school homework is worth 20% of the kids. grade. Like, like we know grading homework doesn't help kids, right? But how do we as teachers work within the systems and within the, the needs um, that I wouldn't say needs, but within the systems that are and structures that we have to work within, right? Whether it be an admin telling the school, hey, uh, homework is has to be worth this amount or a team that says, hey, we, you know, we want to make homework worth 10, 15, 20 percent of the grade. But I know that you're doing BTC and want to do something different. But how do you still work around that? Or parents that want to have their kids homework, which you know, Peter and I agree. I don't, I don't know why parents would want so much homework. Um, we know that practice is important, but uh, we also know that, you know, as a parent, time with my kids is important, right? I go and play in a band with my son, and that time to me is super important. And when a uh, a teacher says, no, you need to be doing an hour of your of this work at home, that is taking away an hour of that I could be spending with my kid playing together, playing music. And so, um, you know, that's just personally, you know, I know homework is important. I know check your understand. I, I should say this. I know practice and check your check their understanding is important. But um, I do have an issue with taking away my time as a father being able to use that time together with my kids because, you know, I'm at work all day and they're at school all day. So, so Peter gets into how we could possibly, you know, do some things to work around those systems. So, uh, again, this should drop the day before election day. I hope you guys all get out there and vote. Um, if you live in, for some, how you live in Modesto (laughs) and you live in my district, I would appreciate the vote for me. Um, if you're on social media, you can send that out. But I hope you all get out there and vote. A really important election for important education things going on in our country. So I hope you enjoy this episode of Teaching That Counts. This is part two of my interview with Peter Lilladal. Enjoy. Um, I got a couple more questions if we have some time. I know we have a little bit of time here. So I guess another thing that came up was the importance of non-curricular tasks. I knew there were a lot of sessions on that. And yeah. my question is, how often should we, re, we, re, we be revisiting these non-curricular tasks throughout the school year um, and why? And why? So, and I know there's this urge to, okay, so if you're a novice listener, what's the difference between a curricular task and a non-curricular task? Right. So um, a non-curricular task is a task that is clearly mathematical but it also clearly isn't part of the curriculum you're teaching or part, and, and, and that's clear to not just you, but to the students as well, right? So it's a task about, like I was doing a task yesterday with grade four students where we were, um, it's in the new book, it's called the carnival, carnival conundrum. It's also known as the mag, magic V task where they're just trying to put the numbers one to five into five circles so that certain conditions are met and they're doing a ton of addition of one digit numbers, Mm -hmm. that's not a grade four standard, right? Like it's, so it's clearly mathematical, but it's also clearly not part of the curriculum. Uh, A curricular task is something that is clearly part of the curriculum and is of course mathematical. So what's the value of the non-curriculars? So first of all, what we have found is that students, it's much easier to build a culture of thinking using non-curricular tasks to start off with because it creates, it makes it the room playful. It makes the, the task feels playful and, and fun. And the kids are more likely to give themselves to, to, to it because of that playfulness. Um, we're asking kids to be very different in a thinking classroom. If they're, if they're going to a, into a random group and up to a vertical whiteboard, like I did for the first time yesterday with a group of grade fours, 
there's a lot of stuff going on in their heads and in their emotions and so on and so forth. The last thing we need to be doing is trying to hit a standard at the same time. And that's the last thing we need to be doing for the kids and for the teacher, right? Like this is new for you too. You haven't had the kids at the whiteboards as well. The last thing you need to be doing is trying to hit your learning intention for the day, right? right? So, so it just kind of takes the pressure off and allows you to really be present in your pedagogy and the students to be present in their learning, right? So we found that students need to have four to six experiences with non-curriculars when you're starting to build a thinking classroom. So that could be at the beginning of the school year, but it could happen today or it could happen in October or whenever you decide that you're gonna start building start off with some of these non-curriculars. Now, I know that time is, is precious and we feel like I don't have time to do that, but you will get the time back. I promise you, I promise you, because once they start thinking, we're tearing through content, like just tearing through content. Yeah, yeah. So that's one place to, to use it. Another place to use it is anytime you are playing with your own pedagogy. So mm-hmm. building thinking classrooms isn't like it's 14 practices and it's not like bam i'm doing all 14 on day one no don't you're (laughs) you're doing aside from the thinking task you're doing two other practices on day one that's what you're thinking of and then you're adding them one at a time after that so every time you're adding in a new practice like the first time you're thinking about launching verbally with the kids standing around you're the first time you're working on not answering their questions you're the first time you're going to do a consolidation like Again, you're working on your pedagogy. The last thing you need to do is to think about trying to hit a standard at the same time, right? Like, like so anytime you are using or changing your practice is a good time to use a non-curricular task. It's also really good to use them when the kids are coming back from a break. So coming back from spring break or, or the winter break or a reading break or whatever. And, you know, they've gotten out of their routines a little bit. So it's a great way to reestablish the norms of a thinking classroom, especially in middle school and high school, because you got to remember that it's not like the kids are in a thinking classroom 24 seven. They got anywhere from three to seven other teachers who are maybe not doing thinking classrooms. Right. right. So those are sort of the dominant normative structures of a school still. And so if they're coming back from a one week off, even a long weekend, they may be indexing more to those sort of global standards or norms than your particular classroom norm. So it's really good to sort of reestablish the norms of a thinking classroom when they come back from a break. But also when they come out of something really, really heavy, like maybe we've been really slogging our way through graphing for the last, you know, three weeks. Maybe it's maybe we should just do a fun numeric um non-curricular task just to sort of lighten the mood maybe it's a it's feeling very friday-ish and we it's like the kids are pretty burnt out let's do something else so we're still going to be mathematical we're still moving the ball down the field but it's 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 more non-curricular so they're super important right they're super important all of those things i mentioned still amount to less than five percent of instructional time right so we're still most of the time doing curricular thinking tasks thin sliced or thick sliced it's but those non-curriculars are vital i always tell a teacher going into a school year you know like if you want to know how because they often say how many do we need i say right look if you're if you got 20 you are in great shape uh 12 at a minimum but 20 is and and don't worry about the fact that the kids saw it last year because they'll remember doing the test they won't remember how to do it or what the the Mm -hmm. what the answer was so they'll go oh i like this one and then they'll go to work right so remember kids will play the same video game over and over and over and over and over again so they don't mind doing the same (laughs) they'll watch they'll watch a youtube video on the same video game over and over again oh yeah (laughs) my my kids do that all the time So you're working on building your own thinking classroom and you're thinking to yourself, where am I going to get all these vertical non-permanent surfaces? Well, there's plenty of options out there that you can go and purchase your vertical non-permanent surfaces. One of those places that has some great options, I've already tried out these products myself and they're sturdy, they're uh, great with kids, and they're very good vertical non-permanent surfaces is EAI Education. You can find them online, eaieducation.com. They offer 
teaching supplies, classroom resources, manipulatives, and educational games at really some of the best prices out there. EA Education provides over 6,000 teaching supplies for grades pre-K all the way up 12th grade. Homeschools, parents, students, and even supplies for college classes. They provide safe and easy ordering and offer 100% satisfaction guaranteed on all their products. So if you're looking for what you need for your classroom, go to eaieducation.com and check them out. All right. So another question that came up when we were over at the conference was homework. Um, and this, and, and I, I know some answers about homework. My question really is we've got a lot of parents. We've got parents that believe that there needs to be homework coming home every day. There's admin that, that kind of pressure their teachers to be giving a certain amount of homework. So how does a teacher that's doing BTC style BTC and understands like, you know, homework as, as we've heard before can be a dumpster fire. <laughs> how can we manage those situations? Yeah. So there's a third element too, right? So like we have parents who want homework, we, which I don't know why, like I was as a parent, I hated homework, like what great way to ruin an evening. Right. Right. Because it's not like my kids are doing it up in the room on their own. Nope. This is kitchen table and it's, it's, I'm there the whole time. And yeah. um, so the parents, and then there's the administrator who's pushing for it because maybe parents are pushing on them. But then there's also either school or departmental policy around homework as something that gets graded yeah. to lower yeah. the sting of testing. So like if homework is 20% of the mark type of thing, just to take some of the edge off of the tests and quizzes. So there's all of these different things that are happening in the world around us. So let's let's unpack, first of all, the problems with homework. I don't think there's a single teacher listening to this podcast who's who's going, oh, yeah, homework works great. Like this is, <laughs> yeah, like it's no problem for me, right? Like every single teacher I've ever talked to is like, so how's homework going? And they're like, they roll their eyes and they're like, oh, right. I'm like, so what's the problem? And, and they're like, it's not, you know, like it's not working. And my question's always, so who who does their homework? And they're like, the kids who don't need to do their homework. Right. Right. And who's not doing it? The kids who need to do it. Right. And homework is a, such a and it's such a problem this way. Right. It's it's such a broken construct of education. I'm not the first to say this. Alfie Cohn wrote an entire book on it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. So why is it such a problem? So when I interview teachers about what is it you actually want homework to achieve? Right. So what do you what do you want it like if it did work, what would you want it to achieve? Um, they'll they'll often say things like, yeah, but the parents and I, go, I don't care about that. <laughs> and then they'll go, well, you know, my administrator, I don't care about that. And they'll say we have a departmental policy. I don't care about that. I want to know what you want it to achieve. You. Right. Forget about all the external constraints. What do you want it to do for you and your learners? And when I ask the question, I cut through all that other stuff. It, it basically comes down to three things. I want homework to be a safe place for students to make mistakes and learn from their mistakes. Yeah, I want that too, right? That's a great answer. Right. I want homework to be a way for the students to see if they can do on their own what they did in groups in class that day. That's also a great answer. I want that as well. Or they'll say, I want homework to be a way for students to check their understanding, a kind of self-assessment. I want that too. These are great answers, right? Like that's what we want homework to achieve. I think everybody can acknowledge that that's what we want it to do Absolutely. on its best day. Yeah. I interview kids, hundreds of kids. Not a single kid said homework is a safe place to make mistakes <laughs> and learn from mistakes. Not one. Not Nobody said homework is a way for me to see if I can do on my own what I did in groups today in class. Nobody said that. Nobody said that. Number one reason kids do homework, it's for grades. Yeah. Number two yeah. reason, I have a parent, usually mom, who makes me do it. Number three reason, the teacher makes me do it. Nobody said homework is a way for me to check my understanding, right? Like, we want to know why homework is such a dumpster fire. That's why homework is such a dumpster fire. Right. The goals, yeah. the gap between the goals of teachers and the, and the motives of students is so massive that, that it, 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 it's unbridgeable, right? So what did we do in the BTC research? We rebranded it. We called it 
check your understanding questions. If that's what we want it to be, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. And then we have to make a whole bunch of other adjustments, right? right? It's we don't assign it. We give kids opportunities to do it. We don't grade it. We don't collect it. We don't. We, it's not an exit ticket. They, 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 they do it. We give them opportunity to do it. They do it, and then they, they, uh, they do it for their own sake. And we have been able to ramp up the engagement with that through using mild, medium, spicy, and a whole bunch of other little nuances that we do. But it is such a better thing when we do it as something that the kids are doing for themselves as a check your understanding question right right and and it's so vital and we have three rules around it when we when we when we set up this um these uh check your understanding questions at the end of the lesson we say three rules rule number one you're going to do some of these you're going to sit down take out a piece of paper and you're going to do some of these or an individual whiteboard number two you choose where you want to start, choose where you want to go, because we put them in mild, medium, spicy. Right. And rule number three, check your answers with the people sitting around you. And if you need help, get help. And if somebody else needs help, give help. And and like we can't get the kids to stop. I was doing it yesterday in a grade uh, in a grade two class. We couldn't get the kids to stop. Right. Like it's like, OK, it's recess. You need to go out. <laughs> and the kids like, no, give me another spicy. Right. <laughs> And we have, and I've seen it all the way up to high school, where the kids are like, "I need, I need more of these," and and the minute we say this is now homework, you have to do it at home. This is your exit ticket. It stops being an intrinsic thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's happening here is that the kids are having this mastery experience, and a mastery experience is when the kids know something and they know they know it. And when they know they know it, it's an incredibly satisfying feeling. And they just want to stay in this state. Yeah. Right? So we cannot make it extrinsic. So, but what do we do when we have parents who want homework or administration who wants homework? So one of the things we have to understand is when we compare a thinking classroom to sort of a more normative classroom. So think about that grade or that algebra one class where the kids are sitting and they're taking notes for 35 minutes of the lesson. Oh, I don't want to imagine it. <laughs> right? And every once in a while, the teacher set, turns and says, now you try one of these and the kids try one for a bit and then they continue working in their notes. By the end of that lesson, or as that lesson's winding down, and the, the main principles that have been happening is that, that sort of I write, you write notes, and now you try one questions occasionally. Mm -hmm. How many questions have the kids done by the end of the lesson, right? Like on their own, they've if they've actually done the I do or the, the now you try one, they've done maybe two or yeah. three, yeah. right? They may have, have written notes on other ones that the teachers demonstrated. But in that setting, They've actually had no time to get in the sandbox on their own and play with this. They've had no chance to do any questions. And we know kids need to do questions, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So now what's left? Well, time's up. So now the rest is homework. You got to go do it on your own without my support at home where, you know, parents either love it or hate it. But think about a thinking classroom on the same lesson where they've been at the whiteboards the whole day or the whole hour and we we're we're documenting this there's some lessons where the kids have done by the end of the lesson they've done 30 questions Oof, right oh. do they really need to do more homework now they may have done a whole bunch they've done 20 questions in their groups they maybe did a couple of questions as part of their notes and now they've done maybe six or seven questions on their own in the check your understanding questions and the bell rings i don't think they need to do more at home Right. But it's such a vastly different landscape. Parents don't know that. Parents don't know that in their physics class, the kids did no questions on their own. But in their math class, they've done 30 questions, some in groups, some as part of notes, some on their own by the end of the lesson. So do we really need them to do more? So usually our response to parents is, um, look, here's a website. You can get lots of questions there. If you want your child to do homework, you can select some from there. If you go onto the class course management system or look at the class notes for the day, you'll know what kind of questions to select. And you can select however many you want your child to do. 
Parents do not like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> what they want is they want they want their kids to do homework, but they want you to be the heavy. They want you to be the bad guy who assigns the homework, right. and they're the ones who are are supporting or making their kids do it. They don't want to be the one who assigns it. But if you put them in that position, they're going to have to think a little bit more critically about actually what it is that they that they're doing, right? So we often say that here's a website or here's two websites. You can get lots of questions there. Go ahead, fill your boots, right? But that's not the relationship I have with your child. Now, that's not to say that kids can't take their questions home with them or that the kids, uh, you might say, you know, here's here's a couple more that in case you're curious, try these. Um, but we don't really feel a need to have to do that because if you do a good thinking classroom lesson, everything that they need is within the lesson. Now, administrators are a little bit different, right? Especially around this idea where we want to lessen the sting of quizzes and tests, where, where they may actually, I work in school, I was in a school this week where they have a policy that 20% of the grade has to come from homework assignments. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it has to be individual work. Well, if that's a policy and you have no way to get around it, then you got to do it. But... Don't call it check your understanding questions. The value of check your understanding questions is that it happens at the end of the lesson. It creates that master experience. Call that check your understanding questions. If you have to do something else, call it assignments. Call it homework. Call it take home quizzes. Take Call it anything you want, but you need to keep these things as separate events so that you're not corrupting the, the, the sort of mastery experience of check your understanding questions with this sort of this has to be done it's a hoop jump it's a box tick it's whatever because they bring a very different personality to those environments and you don't want those two to get blended right right i'm yeah, still not a fan of it but you know we got to do what we got to do sometimes yeah we got yeah. to be right, right. <laughs> got to get mm -hmm. our jobs um well peter i i enjoy talking to you today i have one more question but we're we're kind yeah, of over good. time here. So I'm hoping that maybe sometime this year you'll be available to come back on and talk about this other topic, which is um, going from the collective knowing and doing to the individual oh, yeah. knowing and doing. I know that we learned a lot about uh, it, it. Actually, what you said at the conference, and I'm just going to give a quick because I it really um, made my te the teachers I work with, it made them feel a whole lot better, was that it doesn't have to be consolidation and notes and check your understanding and this all together with the board work because there's just a lot you know with 45 50 minute classes how do you manage all of that so um I, i'm giving i guess i'm giving a tease to everyone if it's possible you can come back on and talk about that it was so um it, it was it was so much clarity in really how do we run a building thinking classrooms and how much time to spend on the boards which um yeah. I think you said 28 uh, what did you say? Uh, 15. We want to spend uh, a third of the lesson in the closing. A third of the right? lesson. It's, it's that vital. And if you don't want to wait, and I will come back, and if you don't want to wait until then, if you pick up the new book, the green book, even if you're not a K-5 to teacher, because that's a K-5 to book, the whole book is sort of built around this idea of how do you launch the lesson, what's the body of the lesson look like, and then what's the closing of the lesson look like, and what, how do how do we do that with through consolidation notes and check your understanding questions? Um, I'm working on the secondary version, the six to twelve right now, and it'll be a central part Ooh. of that as well. But you know, you're going to have to wait a bit. So if you're impatient, you don't want to wait for the next podcast. Uh, pick up the green book and read about that in part one of the book. Awesome! Thank you so much, um, everyone out there listening. Make sure you go and grab that green book. It is a wonderful read, regardless of what grade you teach. Um, that first piece. And um, I just want to tell you, if you're a special ed teacher out there, some of those tasks that are in the green book really work well for kids in any grade level and in any di neurodivergent space. So we've been working with that in, in our schools here. So I appreciate the book. Uh, go out and buy it. And I appreciate your time today spending with us on the podcast. Yeah, Great conversation as usual. Thank you. Thanks so much.